Hello, and welcome to Mapping the College Audition, a podcast where we explore the landscape of the college theater world and try to demystify this daunting audition process. I'm your host, Charlie Murphy, director of MTCA, Musical Theater College Editions, and today we have a great show lined up for you. Um, Stephen Shellhart um, is a fellow Carnegie Mellon alum. He was just between me and Leo at Carnegie Mellon, though again, the debate rages of who was before who, and we'll never know. Um, We also have a really excellent relationship with Roosevelt over the years. As Stephen mentioned, um, a lot of our alumni have gone there, Uh, and Roosevelt came to our college fair this summer too, so you may, many of you have attended that, and some of you at least heard about it on the pod, um, but Roosevelt was one of our participants in that. Um, This is another one of our college deep dives where we give you that snackable audio tour into various great theater programs around the country. Uh, Today, we settled the debate on CCPA at Roosevelt University being the preferred nomenclature for Stephen, at least. Um, We talked about that idea that you don't necessarily have to go to New York City or LA when you're graduated from school. Um, Stephen talked about the idea of training transformative artist citizens. We talked about the difference between the BFA MT and the BFA MT dance at Roosevelt. Uh, We talked about the myth that an audition is all about singing. Uh, We talked about intention informing everything. Stephen reminds you not to apologize in your dance videos, or really ever. Uh, And Stephen really beautifully modeled this idea that we are all a work in progress, and that's what they're looking for in their students. Okay, Megan, before we get into Stephen, um, how are you? How's your life? Let's check in. It's good. Um, I'm really loving our podcasting recordings. Hearing juxtaposition in between what I'm learning in school and our podcast Mm. are really, really gelling at the moment. And hopefully our listeners are feeling that way too. Are you learning more from our podcast guests or your professors? You can be honest. They're not Mm. listening. Well, my wallet says that I'm learning more from class, but my heart is saying our podcast. What a capitalist. Megan, what a capitalist. You know, that's not how we roll. You want to be that way too? My heart to be with the podcast? Yes. I'll take your heart versus your wallet. (laughs) And Charlie, we're in like this difficult part of the year, maybe not difficult, but busy part of the year. What do, you, what do you want to share with our listeners about what we're navigating? Well, I did just want to say, I mean, what a year, where where we are in all of it. Um, right. I was just at like our most recent in-person mock audition for MTCA. This is where yeah. our students are trying to make that like transition back into what it is to work in person again. So they're practicing auditions with accompanists and all the usual nerves and how do you walk in a room and stand in front of a table of auditors and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And us too. And us too. Us behind the table. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're All the coaches are trying to learn it again and the admins are trying to remember all this stuff. And I just was like, <laughs> maybe it's also being a dad. I'm getting more emotional than ever. Um, but this, uh, this process is always like impossibly hard. And I think this year might literally be the hardest ever. Um, cause like last year was insane, but it was like the kind of insane that you could like slug through on adrenaline. Cause it just like the students didn't have a choice, right? It was like, all of a sudden it was like virtual and we're figuring out and the colleges are figuring out and but we're just diving in and we're p- pivoting and adjusting. There's something kind of magical about last year actually. Cause it was just like, what are we going to do? We're surviving a pandemic. We're doing it. And there's something about this year where it's just like, we're feeling all the after effects of all that, right? Like a little bit like, you know, sort of second show letdown, like after you had the opening night and then you're like, okay, here we go, you know? Or, or I was thinking maybe it's even more like the, when you get sick after a show, like you just oh, did no. the whole, oh, I did my two week run and I crushed it. And then you're like, my body is dying now, you know? Cause it feels like so many of our students are trying to like run the marathon of this process. But after the last 18 months, their fuel tank is low. Um, which is not, you know, we try to give some advice on this podcast. None of that is advice. I'm just saying <laughs> I feel you out there if you're struggling. Because this year where you're going to have to do in-person and virtual and you're sick of your screens, but maybe you're not as confident in person because you haven't been doing it for 18 months. Yeah. I feel you and I love you and you're not alone out there probably feeling some of those things if you are. Yeah, I think it's just acknowledging the roller coaster that we're in and the people behind the table are feeling that just as much as you are. Oh, yes. Of- going back and forth is probably a little bit more difficult than sticking to one area. Yep. And I I was saying this at our latest webinar, but I was saying like the, whatever you can do to grab onto like some spark of inspiration, if it's about the Broadway's back, yes, here we go. You know, but that didn't used to be as hard of a challenge, but now I do think it's something that we all have to do to go. Let me, let me grab on. Let me, what can I ride that roller coaster that's going to get me up to the top of the hill at least before the the plunge and then get back up. There's just that little bit more um, that we got to dig deep. 
Yeah, I know. I think Leo said this too when I was a young and in auditioning of uh, bring something with you to the audition that like sparks that little bit of joy, mm. whether it's like an object, a song, something that you can tangibly feel. You can bring that in the uh, in-person audition, but also just like put that right next to the, the laptop right there and have it with you. So true. Now yeah. you're giving Leo credit for Marie Kondo is what you're saying. He invented Marie Kondo. Sparking joy. <laughs> Maybe so not that phrase, but maybe I don't think Brie Kondo was bringing, uh, you know, items of hers into an audition. But who knows? Man? I don't know. I don't know Brie uh, personally. You should see her Maria and West Side Story. It's pretty great. I bet. I bet. Um. All right. Well, let's get into Stephen and this really fun episode. Well, we are honored to have Stephen Shellhart on the pod today. Uh, Stephen has a BFA in music theater from Carnegie Mellon University. He's worked as an actor, director, and choreographer in Chicago, touring, and internationally. Uh, he served as the artistic director of the Boho Theater in Chicago, where he will be stepping down this year. Um, Stephen also worked as a full-time lecturer of music theater at Northwestern University, before now serving as the head of musical theater at the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt is located in Chicago, Illinois. They take class sizes of about 25 people. They offer degrees in BFA Musical Theater, BFA Acting, BFA Musical Theater Dance, which we'll talk about a lot today. Um, Stephen, how are you doing? Welcome on the pod. I am great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I am hoping you can, before we dive too deep into you and the school, can you settle the debate of how we pronounce and or label your school? This may be the most like controversial. Do we say Roosevelt? Do we say Roosevelt CCPA? God forbid, do we say Roosevelt? Do we say CCPA <laughs> slash Roosevelt? How do you like to be called uh, you know, when you're, people are referring? To you. you know, that's a great question. So many, so many um, ways to, to say our school's name. Um, we're Chicago College of Performing Arts um, at Roosevelt. So it's a conservatory program housed within a larger university. So CCPA is sort of the abbreviation we like to say here in Chicago, at least. Um, but a lot of people who are applying know it as, you know, Roosevelt, uh, as like the, the overarching um, title of the school, but really it is the Chicago College of Performing Arts at Roosevelt. I can empathize as someone who runs a company with four letters. People don't like a four digit acronym. No, they, they're they nicknamed with three, but when you go up to four, they're like MCPTA. I'm like, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, well, I'd love to, before we get too deep into CCPA, um, can you tell me a little bit about your own background? So how did you find yourself to be in this position? What, what inspired you to take on this exciting new mantle? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I've had a, a very a unique and interesting sort of journey towards education and where I'm at now. I, um, I graduated from Carnegie Mellon in 2005, uh, went on tour um, with the production of Alter Boys. Uh, Alter Boys! Um, mm. And, you know, from the tour, I found myself auditioning uh, for shows in Chicago, um, just really wanting to go where the work was. Um, knew I wanted to go to New York, but knew that I also wanted to be a working actor uh, first and foremost. So it, I, I got a show in Chicago, took me here, was here in Chicago performing on stages for about four or five years, um, met my husband uh, here in Chicago, um, and we moved to New York just because we wanted to, you know, we didn't have any jobs lined up because we thought, you know what, we're a little bit older now, we can, we can handle this, we have some uh, credits on our resume that we feel good about. And so we moved to New York. We were there for about uh, six years, um, working a lot regionally, um, getting into sort of side jobs, uh, working as a, you know, answering phones for Stuart Talent in mm -hmm. New York and, and getting sort of behind the scenes that way on day jobs. Um, and then eventually, you know, when marriage equality happened, um, we knew we wanted to officially get married. Uh, legally and start a family. And for us, Chicago is where my family was. I grew up here. Um, um, uh, my husband went to Northwestern, so we knew we had connections here. It was a city that we knew we could raise a family in. So we came back here um, in order to kind of make stability happen in my life. I got on the other side of the table. I was a casting director and producer at Writers Theater here in Chicago, which is a big regional theater. Um, started casting uh, for a couple other theaters freelance and and also teaching along the side of that. And it was the, the teaching, the educational component that I kind of fell in love with, um, really wanting to make sure that the rooms that I created as a casting director or a director or 
um, anyone behind the table was a, a safe and productive one, was inclusive, um, was supportive of the artists in the room. I, I kind of wanted to create a space that I didn't feel I got a lot when I graduated and came into the profession. Um, and so I, I ended up, you know, kind of teaching at Northwestern for a couple of years, like you said, um, in the musical theater department, which is a certificate program. And then when this job at um, CCPA at Roosevelt came up, uh, it was, you know, it was a job that I knew um, as a head of a program, I would have more impact creating curriculum. I would have a little more impact in the say of a student's overall arc and journey at school. Um, and I really loved that. I loved being able to have, to be part of that conversation and be in the room when we were kind of trying to enhance a BFA program for the, the, the industry that we're living in now, which is very different than the industry that I graduated into. Um, it's such a cool journey, and it's a—it's uh, one we actually have not talked a lot about with our artist series, but um, it's worth make, getting into at some point, the, the idea of that it doesn't have to be New York or L.A. where you start out, that the sort of really viable... We, I remember when I graduated from Carnegie Mellon, we did a third showcase in, in Chicago. It was like seven of us just like drove to Chicago oh, and like did a little showcase to see what that would feel like. Yeah. Um, well, I think and makes, I think... It's a real... It's the work. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think how um, I what I say to my students all the time, and what I truly believe in is that as and I call them artists. You know, it's like we are artists because I think longevity is really important. Mm -hmm. How what are you going to say when you are sixty or seventy? It's not just about getting one big Broadway show or one TV and film role. It's about what are you doing your whole entire career. So being able to know that you can go where the work is and then have a home base, but it doesn't have to be in one or two cities. It can be mm -hmm. anywhere you feel you are most comfortable um, is important, I think. Mm -hmm. So true. Um, let's get a little into Roosevelt. So, you know, um, in your experience so far at the school, what do you feel like it means to be a CCPA student? So what kind of um, qualities do you feel like you see in a lot of your students? Um, that's a great question. You know, uh, I was really intrigued by... Um, coming to work in this program because of, you know, its social justice mission. Roosevelt is founded on the social justice mission. Um, I think the theater conservatory and its values, um, you know, we truly believe that every human being should have access and opportunity and visibility and agency and voice. Um, and so our students are, you know, socially aware. I think that's important. Um, aware that we have a responsibility as artist citizens, not just artists, that, that we need to um, use our art to hopefully create a more fair and just society. I think that, mm. that social awareness is a big thing for us in our school. Um, social justice in every aspect through classrooms, productions, recruitment, teaching, um, across the board uh, is really important for us. I think individuality uh, we really, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was at school, it felt like, oh, I'm coming in and I am very much this type of actor and I'm filling mm -hmm. a, a, a spot here to be, you know, the, the leading man tenor and then every class had one. Um, our classes are made up of every type of artist and human being and uh, we celebrate that individuality. And um, I think that is uh, students who are coming with some agency, with um, with knowing who they are in the moment, knowing that that will grow, but being comfortable in their own skin is important. Um, so those are the students we look for that are, that are, are obviously um, that show some potential in their talent, but also um, are strong sort of well-rounded humans that we can guide and, and shape along the way to be, to use their art for a better society. I love it. So let's imagine now I come in, I've, I've been accepted and I'm this unique individual with my social justice mindset. <laughs> How am I going to be changed four years later? So now that Stephen's got to have some, you got the hand in the arc of the curriculum of what you were going for. Yeah. What does that look like? How do, how do I end up different as a senior than I was as a freshman? Yeah. So, you know, I like to look at the four years as freshman, you know, the, the sort of trajectory being um, foundation, first year, process, second year exploration, third year, and application their senior year. So mm -hmm. in their first year, it's about ensemble. It's, it's understanding and respecting that there are, that it's a collaborative art form. 
Um, so they're, they're do ensemble singing, learning how to sing together, foundations of acting um, and acting techniques. And, you know, we don't use, we're not under the philosophy here of one acting technique. I think across the board at, at CCPA, we, we believe that we should expose our students to all kinds of techniques and they should be the ones to choose what works for them um, and what doesn't. Uh, sophomore year is all about process. So we, we really teach them um, how to be in the room, how to have a good work ethic, how to be prepared, how to learn a song, how to um, come into the room. And what I say to my students all the time is how do we control the controllables <laughs> in any sort of environment that we are in? Um, and because so much, so much, many times in this business, we focus on what is out of our control and we let those kind of lead our journey when in reality, so much that goes into casting a show or building a show doesn't revolve around talent. It, there's mm -hmm. a lot of moving parts to it. The, sh the, the productions are bigger than us. So knowing that in process and then junior year, exploring all different kinds of styles, techniques, um, getting them, getting our students out into the Chicago industry. You know, we, we are a school that's in the heart of Chicago. Chicago mm -hmm. for me is one of the best theater towns in the the country. Um, there's over 250 non-equity theaters here. There's a bunch of equity theaters. Um, our, our teachers, our, our faculty here, our professionals working right now. Like you said, I'm an artistic director at a theater company currently and mm -hmm. trying to bring back current information, being two steps ahead in the industry so that we can make sure we're keeping the wheel moving forward and not backward. So, you know, and then by the time they're senior years, hopefully they'll have some connections with um, people in the city, professional development, getting them access to the theaters they'll be auditioning for. Um, so really what we provide is really focused individual attention. Our classes are small, um, but we also have a great trajectory where they're learning and building each year upon what they've already learned. So by the time they're seniors, they are well-rounded humans. They're well-rounded artists. They're prepared for the professional industry today. Um, and and also we do it with, you know, we teach through, I believe in teaching through kindness and respect um, mm -hmm. and knowing that everyone's voice is valuable. So that idea of putting, you know, at Carnegie Mellon, I felt like sometimes in conservatory training, there's an idea of breaking people down and building them back up. But so mm -hmm. much of the building blocks of building people back up is are skipped. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so when I graduated, I left kind of feeling like, well, I know I know how to learn a song, but how do I pay my bills when I graduate? How do I audition? How do I look for auditions? How do I have a life as an artist? Um, and I think Roosevelt does a really good job of, of really training individual human artist citizens to really know, you know, how to have agency and how to, and how to go about this world and look for work and get work. And, um, and I think that makes a difference. I love it. Um, why do you find in the, maybe the past couple of classes, especially um, if a student has a number of great options, including CCPA, why might they not choose your school? Why might they end up going somewhere else? Um, well, you know, I feel like CCPA and uh, and our program is has been kind of under the radar for for a little while. Um, right now, I feel like there's a lot. It's not as flashy as some of these other conservatory programs. And I think that's on purpose. We're about the training. We're about, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are not promising our students, like, you know, you're going to graduate and, and get all of these big Broadway things. That is part of the journey. That's what we hope for our students. But we're really training our mm -hmm. students to be transformative artists and to go where the work is. Um, and I think a lot of times uh, people go towards bigger named schools or schools that have a little more flash to them. Um, and I think if you're really wanting to come to a city that has theater all around it, but be able to focus on the training, um, freshman and sophomore year is, is really about the training here. Freshmen can mm -hmm. perform, um, which makes us a little bit different than some of the other conservatories that we have performance opportunities for our freshmen ensemble based, um, but they get mm -hmm. to be on stage applying what they're learning in the classroom. Um, but, you know, who knows? I do also think every school is uniquely, you know, different and, and the students have to go where their heart is. And if you mm. if you have a, a program that you love or you go to visit a school and you like the environment that it's in, like there's no right school. I think there's no mm. one right school for everybody. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into it. Um 
But the people that do come to CCPA and do choose our program, I think, are benefiting from um, a really great faculty, are benefiting from the social justice mission, which I think is really important in our industry right now Mm. of how can we change the world with our art? Um, How can we create new work and artists that will be on the opposite side of the table um, and not just on stage so that their stories can be told? I love it. Um, what about outside of the theater program? So may- maybe now, what does Roosevelt University as a, a large university offer a prospective theater student? Yeah, well, um, obviously the city that it's in, we are, in, like I said, we're in the heart of Chicago. Um, the campus is downtown. You come out the doors and you are in an energy that is vibrant. Um, we have Chicago Shakespeare Theater. We have Steppenwolf. We have the Goodman. Um, we have so many theaters right around the corner that we partner with and, and our faculty have connections with. So internships and um, and, and getting that uh, kind of experience their junior and senior year to start making mm-hmm. connections. So when you graduate, you already know some people in the community. You have a better sense of the theater that's happening in um, Chicago. Uh, we really provide them that I will say the dorms and the buildings at Roosevelt are, are gorgeous. The dorms are mm. in a huge high rise overlooking Lake Michigan and the city. And, you know, I remember my freshman year, Charlie, I was in Mudge in Pittsburgh. I was in the basement <laughs> of right. this beautiful building with one small little window. Um, and, and so just, just to be able to live and breathe um, in Chicago and see theater and have connections to so many theatrical, artistic, cultural experiences, um, I think makes the experience of a student here very unique. I do not think Mudge would ever be described as gorgeous. <laughs> I've never no. heard that happen. Mudge. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what about, I'd love to just hear a little bit about kind of the different disciplines um, at Roosevelt. I want to get specifically into the music theater dance sure. um, program too, but I'd love to maybe first just hear like, what uh, do you guys feel like you have a discipline that you focus on more than the other? You know, an acting based musical theater school, a more singing based, more, are we really focused on dance or is, is it? You know, what sort of proportions or how would you kind yeah. of talk about the disciplines? Um, well, all three programs and all program heads, I mean, we all believe that we are actors first um, across the board. Acting is the basis of all, all of it. You're telling a story, whether you're with text or with movement or with, with song, um, no matter what. So the acting program and the, the courses in acting that all disciplines get um, are are the emphasis is really on that. Now we have, what makes us really unique is that we do have a musical theater um, major. We also have a musical theater dance major led by the incredible Jane Lanier, Tony nominated Jane Lanier. Um, And I think that was because, you know, look, there are so many, there are so many students out there now, out you know, prospective students who come in having chorus and voice um, and mm-hmm. and singing as the thing that sort of was their in to musical theater, right? And then you have so many prospective students who started in dance, and that is their in into musical theater. And maybe they started mm-hmm. singing later. And I think there should be a place for all. Now, um, again. Jane and I both believe that we are a musical theater program with just two slightly different emphasis. So we're all under the Mm -hmm. same umbrella. I teach musical theater dance majors and musical theater majors in my acting for the musical stage class. Jane teaches both um, majors in all of the dance classes. There's just a little bit more emphasis on, um, uh, you know, the musical theater majors get a little more voice studio time um, and the dance emphasis gets, you know, a, a little more dance time. They're dancing about five times a week and the musical theater majors are dancing about three times a week. Uh, musical theater majors get jazz, tap, and ballet um, and musical theater styles, as well as master classes in world dance and other styles now. But, you know, the, the musical theater dance majors are dancing every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's just the sort of way we kind of look at it is that if you were coming to the table as a dancer who loved musical theater and you see yourself in the ensemble of musicals that you can come mm-hmm. out and, and really plug right into those huge ensemble dance um, numbers and that the musical theater dance concentration is for you if you mm-hmm. are not as strong of a dancer but you want obviously solid dance training but you are coming at it from a voice performance perspective um, then the musical theater major would maybe be your, the way you go. 
Um, and a lot of times we have students audition for musical theater and I see their dance videos and I'm like, these are incredible dancers and they're triple mm -hmm. threats. So the dance emphasis might be a better place for them so they can continue that or vice versa. Jane will say, you know, this is an incredible singer and actor and the dancing is strong, but um, I think they would benefit from more voice voice work. And how does that work with your school in terms of do they have to choose um, which ones they're auditioning for? Can they audition for multiple at the same time? How does that work um, when you're applying? They do have to place um, to pick a focus. So while we can, you know, see them if they say we're going to do musical theater dance, we can then, you know, talk about it and have that open dialogue mm -hmm. with our, you know, the faculty and the students of saying, hey, what about what about the musical theater emphasis if this doesn't work? But uh, from the get go, um, the students do have to kind of pick their focus and audition for that specific major. I love it. And then what about for, we have a lot of actors who kind of are straddling that line of maybe they're a singer actor, they're not totally sure if they want to focus on just a BFA in acting or a BFA mm -hmm. in musical theater. What kind of opportunities from a musical theater perspective are, do the acting majors get? Um, so that's a great question. Uh, I just finished this weekend directing the Freshman Showcase, which is all majors, 70 freshmen, where we just kind of do ensemble numbers um, and, and each major kind of gets featured. Um, that's like a great performance opportunity for all of the majors. The acting majors were singing, the singing uh, majors were dancing and vice versa. Um, but, you know, at, at CCPA, sophomore year is when you can be in the casting pool so freshman year you have performance opportunities with your cohort so the musical theater majors get a little showcase the musical theater dance majors get a little showcase but by sophomore year you are in the pool and acting majors can audition for musicals musical theater majors can audition for plays and it's you can be you can you can audition for anything and so right now um we see a lot of actors who come in and who have been singing their whole lives and while maybe they're not as strong vocally yet um they are able to you know with voice and speech and maybe getting a voice teacher on the side if that fits in their schedule they audition for musicals and they can get leads in musicals mm -hmm. and and that is really cool because at the end of the day like i said we are all actors and longevity so we can't be just trained you know i i expect when our students graduate they will be doing musicals plays film tv all of it they have to know mm -hmm. that's that's the industry they're going to be going into um so they need to be prepared for all of it i love it we're going to take a really short break and on the back end of the break we're going to talk a little bit about the ccpa audition process all right all right Okay, we are back with Stephen Shellhart from CCPA, and we're going to talk a little bit about the audition. So, Stephen, I'd love to ask of like, in short, what do you think makes a great audition for you? Um, a great audition for me is someone who is clearly connected to text, right? I think st uh, story, story, story. What are you saying? What do you what do you want? They're going after something. They have life behind their eyes. They they have opinions and discovery. I see a lot of students who come in and are solely focused on the sound of their voice, um, and I can clock that a mile away. You know, I I we know you can sing within three seconds of you opening your mouth. So after that, it's like what else, right? What else do you have to offer? And that's when the actor comes in. That's when your own point of view comes in. So someone coming in and having a point of view is important for for me. Um, someone coming in and being professional and kind in the room and prepared, um, who's not apologizing for themselves, who who wants to be there, but is there to do the work and, and, and proud of the work that they're bringing into the room. Um, you know, I like to say in any auditions that people enter, I like to see people enter the room like it's a rehearsal, that there's not this um, fear or um, tentativeness Mm -hmm. I know everyone's nervous. I know that's the thing. But if you are majoring in uh, musical theater or, or any of this, like vulnerability and being able to put yourself out and and tell a story in front of others and for others is is part is the main component of what we do. So, being proud of that and knowing that um, you've been prepared enough to just kind of come in and be yourself and have some fun and let go, while also having a strong point of view about the story that you're. You're telling through song. I think that is the biggest thing for, for me. Beautifully said. Is there anything that you really don't want to see in an audition? Something, any pet peeves that turn you off? Yeah, I think the, I think the myth that an audition is about singing is, um, needs to go away a little bit because so many times I, people come in and they just, you know, 
scream at you for two minutes and give you their highest note. Um, and actually a small, subtle ballad is very refreshing to me. Mm. I want to get to know the human that I will be spending four years with. I want to get to know um, the artist's point of view. And it, that doesn't always, sometimes it does mean great big high notes, of course, but it doesn't always mean just coming in with songs that, sh that you're trying to show me everything you can do in two minutes. Mm. And it just becomes about the, the franticness of showing me how high you can belt or how, how big you can sing. It really is um, for me, the, the nuance of, mm -hmm. uh, of coming in and, 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 and being a human in front of me. We're all just human beings, right? So um, having their feet planted on the floor, being able to um, know that we're just working in the room. And if I like the human I see and I'm excited to learn more about them, then I will ask them if they have something else or I will ask them what mm -hmm. their top note is. Um, I will spend time getting to know them that way. So picking songs that they connect to, that they know what they're singing about, um, that they haven't just been given by their voice teacher or, or something that just sounds really good in their voice, that they have a personal mm -hmm. connection to the story, I think is important. When that doesn't happen, um, I'm not as invested and I don't get to see that human, you know? I think the big mm -hmm. difference is they're auditioning for college. They're auditioning for a, a program where they're going to spend a lot of time growing. So potential is really there. You don't, you're not a finished product. You're not showing me opening night performance. You're showing me that you're you're able to pivot and adapt and be open to, to being flexible. Um, and that's really the, the biggest thing for me. Um, how do those answers change at all when we're talking about pre-screen? So any advice for the specific pre-screen audition when you have to be on this little, you know, <laughs> this little window where you're this doing all your work? teeny little camera. Yes. Well, and in this world, this past year and a half, we feel like we've all gotten used to these little strange little boxes we're in. Um, yeah. Pre-screens is really about, uh, I think, just putting your best foot forward, um, making sure that they're one. I think that you are, I think in going back to your question before too, uh, Charlie, is that they, 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 they know about CCPA. You know, when I ask in an audition or a pre-screener, we ask a question about why you want to come to Roosevelt, why you want to come to CCPA. Having someone who has done their research about our program is important, that it's not just another school. They're checking off the box of a list of schools of, that they could, mm -hmm. they could get into, and it's just another audition package for another school. It's really knowing that the student knows a little bit about our program and has questions that they want to ask about it. Um, mm -hmm. So with pre-screens, really, it is... Are they singing appropriate material? Is it material that is age appropriate? You know, I don't, I, uh, I love being alive from company, but I don't need to hear it on an 18 year old. There are ways to kind of just be prepared in your pre-screen as, as far as sounding great. And ha again, making it about the story. Are there discoveries? Are there times when I'm watching it feel like it's a, a fresh moment in this character's journey and not some song that this person has sung over and over again and has no attachment to. Um, mm. So I would say making sure your pre-screens and the choices you do are fresh um, and that you have a, a strong perspective on what these characters want in the song. Even if it's a minute long, <laughs> you can tell a really good story in a minute. So that would be my biggest advice for pre-screens. And then once you get into the audition room, it really is about getting to know you more as a human. Well, this leads me right to my favorite question, which is, so you talked about the idea of kind of getting to know them beyond the monologues and songs that they bring in. If you had to estimate how much of the decision is based on the skill displayed in the work, so in the songs, in the monologue, what you see as their singing and acting skill um, versus those intangibles like the interview questions and if you give any adjustments, like how much is about the human being and how much is about the skill that you're seeing? Um, well, the skill is important. Obviously, you know, this is a really hard business to go into. So I would never want to encourage someone to go into a program where I felt like, you know what, this this night might might not be the successful path for you. Right. But mm -hmm. I do also know that there's potential and I do love to, you know, we are a four year conservatory program. So watching the growth of my students over the four years as they grow into themselves and knowing that if we are that human experience and human and life experience actually just makes our work even more textured. So mm -hmm. seeing the foundations of the human is really important right off the bat. Skill is just as important, but I would say 60-40 for skills mm -hmm. and interview because 
look, the, the wild card questions we ask, you know, we, we do a wild card. And in that, I, do, I like to see what people do outside of theater, their hobbies, mm-hmm. what interests them in the world, what does, what socially are they fighting for, especially mm-hmm. at a school that has a social justice mission and where we are trying to incorporate that into all of our um, teaching and material we choose and productions we choose and the people we get behind the table. I think it's important to kind of know what our humans in front of us are standing for and fighting for and and what they want to see in the world. Um, And those questions really do inform us about the the type of student that's going to come here. If it's someone who's just like, Oh, I love, I want to be on Broadway. That's a great goal. Um, But we are looking more for students who want to change the world with their art and want to be, Mm. like we say, artists, citizens um, and, and have value in their voice and will speak up when they think something is unjust um, mm. or not equitable. And I think that is extremely important with Roosevelt. I love it. And you're one of the first people to give us an actual number. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> Rarely do we get an actual number value, which I appreciate a lot. Um, what about for, in this could be in a number or just in, in the way that it, it, it happens for you guys, how does it work if um, you're interested in the person um, artistically, how does it then work with the academics and the university broader, the broader university with grades and SAT scores and essays and things like that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's important, right? Um, each, because it is housed in a conservatory housing of university, gen eds come through Roosevelt. Um, each student has about one gen ed a semester that they have to, to, to fill. Um, but honestly, it is about the we are training theater artists and Mm. I don't know about you, but I, I loved English and I loved history. I was horrible at other things. I knew that this was the thing that I would be the most valuable at in my skill set, And, um, and that is what we look for. So the audition for us, while good, you know, good standing in grades academically is important because I think that goes along with discipline and work ethic. Um, and also knowing that we have to be aware we have to be reading. We have to be aware of what's happening in the world historically and what we are responding to and what things are, what cyclical things our world is falling into and how we can fight against that. That is important. However, mm-hmm. um, we are training them to, in a BFA performance major. So, so if you like them artistically, that you feel like I can get that student. That student is yes, in the if, program. If, they, if we are responding to them artistically, that is the most important factor for us, um, for sure. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, when you're when you're weighing those artistic decisions, especially uh, you talked a little bit about it with the, the three different programs, for musical theater, for you, do you weigh them all equally? Do you weight more on the singing, more on the acting, more on the dance? How does that work for you as you're sort of uh, um, evaluating students' triple threatness, as we say? Yeah, um, you know, I always... Uh, I, I respond to personally, you know, I think personally, I respond to the acting of it. I respond to the storytelling of it. Do I feel something when this person is performing? Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that can be one moment, you know, that's, you know, one, one sort of glimpse into, oh my gosh, this is a point of view of someone, or they've just, they're really connected to the text. I respond to, to that. I, as a musical theater major in, in my program, the dance aspect, I look at their dance videos. They have to be able to, to move, you know, uh, I would say at least a mover plus, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Um, but they, I'm not as I'm concerned about having someone come in and being a triple threat in the musical theater program because we can get you there. Mm-hmm. I'm concerned more with do you have a good foundation in your voice performance? Are you on breath? Are you making sense of phrases? Are you supporting? Um, is there potential there for, for growth um, in your voice? Whether it be, um, you know, again, through, through, through breath work or, or all of that stuff. But for me, it's the acting of it. I think intention informs everything. It informs sound, it informs breath. And if you know who you're singing to and what you want and you have a clear objective when you're, when you're telling a story, then I think your voice will follow suit. Mm-hmm. Um, clearly, you have to sound good. We are musical theater majors, you know. Mm-hmm. So sound is important to me. But again, um, like I said, I know immediately, I think, within one mm-hmm. or two seconds if you can sing. Mm. Um, and if you have potential to grow into your voice, which I think as an 18 year old, we all have potential. We're never going to come into a program at 18, having our full voice yet. Um, Mm -hmm. so as long as there's perspective and point of view there, um, in the storytelling, I am engaged. 
I love it. And then what about when you're watching those dance videos? You know, how are you identifying? What are you looking for from those beginning dancers? Maybe what are you looking for from the advanced beginners? If you see a really advanced dancer, what, what are you sort of looking for in those videos? Um, as you're saying, oh, that person's really... really um, no apologies. You know what I mean? Like, like I, if you can't dance, you can't dance. And like, let's create a video where you are celebrating that fact and you're not apologizing for it. And that even when you're dancing, there is some intention behind it that you're not just doing movements to show that you can do it. Even if that have a fun point of view about it, make a story, make it, you know, make it your own. Um, and for the advanced dancers, again, I, I look at what am what am I feeling? I think a lot of the musical theater dance majors coming into a um, a university with a social justice mission, a lot of their dance pieces are about something specific mm. for them, mm. um, and that is really cool to see. That goes with their interview questions of um, and all that stuff. I really try to get to know the human and see if that human is showing up at all in the work that they are presenting. Um, for us artistically. Um, well, let's wrap up with just a few questions. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the specific challenges of 2021. And you've already talked a little bit about social justice, but um, sort of how your school is preparing to meet the moment, both in terms of uh, some of the demands for racial equity that yeah. have been happening for the past year, but then also the demands of a virtual world that we're in now and could be in for who knows how long. Yeah. I mean, it is... Um... It's challenging, right? I think, uh, especially the virtual element of it, uh, it's not going away. Um, mm -hmm. And and so how can we get creative telling stories um, with, with some virtual components, with multimedia, with all that stuff, knowing, you know, that our artists will know, have to know how to audition live, how to do self-tapes, how to do all of that stuff. Um, that, that feels like we've learned a lot. So the virtual component is not going away. We're trying to incorporate that into um, access, you know, just giving people more access. How do, we, um, how do we make sure that we can not just create kind of like really B-rated movies <laughs> that we can actually still feel like we're, if we go virtually or do a virtual component, it has a live feeling to it. That's important for me. Um, and in terms of, everything this world has been going through in our industry it is about time right and i think for us i will be very transparent and say when i came on board to ccpa and roosevelt we were in transition we were not living up to our social justice mission in terms of what we were the material we were looking at in class the um faculty looking like the world we live in, the student population looking like the world we live in, the stories we tell, feeling like they're stories and perspectives um, from all types of human uh, experiences. That was not the case. We This last year and a half, we've had difficult conversations. We have fought um, to, to make sure that our students are heard, that um, every voice is uh, lifted up, that there is a platform for making sure that we are representing the industry and the world that our students are going to be going into and that the wheel is moving forward um, and that we are, you know, we are really standing behind and putting our words to be, um, to have anti-racist pedagogy, to make sure that we are creating, uh, um, creating equitable experiences for all, that it's not just words. It's not just stuff we put on our website and say, yay, we've done it, that we're putting it into action. So for now, I feel like we have taken huge steps forward um, with our recruitment of making sure we're going into communities and getting the word out about our, our theater um, with people who need it and want it, um, that we are creating scholarships and really backing the financial help for students who might not be able to come to a university like this. I think access is huge. Um, the productions, the season selection, the guest artists we come in, having really open conversations when we get to things like the golden age about race mm -hmm. and why we call it the golden age and the language and breaking that down um, and making sure that we are having our artists know that they have agency, that they have power, that they have voice, um, and that there's also a sense of now what is the new work we can create? How can we devise pieces? And instead of just pulling from the canon, the canon is large and wide. And why do we have a European-centric and, um, you know, 
white perspective on all of the canon that is going on across the board in theater conservatories. It is, it is something that has been a problem forever. And now we're finally trying to dismantle that. And I think while we're not there yet, a hundred percent, I can say in full um, transparency that we are trying and that we are doing our best to have those difficult conversations and put our words into action and listen to our students. They are the future of this profession. They are the next generation of theater artists and theater citizens, and we need to listen. Um, did I hear in there somewhere that uh, you are officially having virtual auditions in terms of the 2022 season? I think you said something about access. And is that is that official? There's an element of live auditions this year as well as virtual. So we are going to still do the sort of virtual audition room for people who can't make it to Chicago. I think that's extremely important. Um, and we're also going to have live auditions. I think that will not go away. I think that mm -hmm. that creates a wide net for us in making sure that we are bringing a wide variety of students into our program. Um, and I think that's really good. I think that's a great thing, actually. Um, any final thoughts? Anything that we missed that you really wanted to hit on today? Um, no, I will just say that I would not be teaching at a program that I didn't believe in. You know, I, mm -hmm. I am an actor first and I still perform. I, like you said, I'm an artistic director in the city. I'm trying to keep on learning myself. I like to say we are all works in progress. And, um, but I really do believe in our program. I believe mm -hmm. the, I, what I love about it is that we take our students with who they are individually. We're not trying to be a cookie cutter by the time they graduate. We want them to be well-informed but and well-rounded artists, but also humans. Um, and our program is growing. And the more um, aware people are of this awesome conservatory program in the middle of one of the best theater cities in the country, I think uh, our program's getting stronger. We're enhancing it, we're, we're growing it, we're trying to be forward thinking. Um, and if you have any interest at all, you know, research us, come visit us, reach out to me, reach out to those people and ask those questions. Because like I said, I think a college audition journey is unique and individual and one place um, is not right for everyone. It's, it's very specifically towards the human that, and the needs that that person wants in a college experience. So I wish everyone going through the college audition you know, journey now the best of luck. But I think CCPA and um, our program is a really solid, awesome option for people who want a long career in the arts. Well, and I also appreciate that as you ask your students to model being in process and being vulnerable, I appreciate your vulnerability and your own <laughs> commitment to being in process today as, as you, uh, you throw those things out there. If people want to know more about um, Roosevelt or CCPA, where would you want us to check you out? What's the best places to follow and, and click things and subscribe sure. to things. I mean, you can always go to our, re um, our website, roosevelt.edu, um, and look at our program. You can also, th there's the directory there, so you can reach out to me anytime um, uh, at sshellhart at roosevelt.edu. You can reach out to any of the program heads that are listed on the, the um, sheet. Um, come visit if you want to visit Chicago, if you can. Um, but if, if not, like, please, I, I, I think the most the more informed you can be about the school you are auditioning for, the better, because then you can weigh the pros and cons that are right for you. So ask questions. There's no stupid questions. This is your life. This is four years journey. Um, and and you, should, you should ask and get as much information as possible um, with your top choices. Stephen, thank you so much for coming on the pod today. We thank really you. Appreciate that. And thank you for what you do. We have so many alumni here at CCPA that have come out of... Um, your training, and I'm just so grateful for you all. That's so nice. And go Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks. <laughs> oh boy, I hope you enjoyed that interview. Megan's laughing because I said, oh boy. Normally I say <laughs> well, which is a weird transition word too. But I said, oh boy, this time. Or a few adjectives. Let's give us some SAT words for today. Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna. Well, actually, don't have SAT words. But uh. I do hope you enjoyed that interview um, with Stephen. I thought he was so beautiful and open and vulnerable. Uh, and I really appreciated his intelligence and his thoughtfulness and his answer. You could tell he was really like present and grounded in the interview and it was really nice. Um, Stephen highlighted a lot of stuff we've hit in take takeaways before. Um, the idea of process over product, we strongly endorse that idea. The idea of artistic individuality slash uniqueness, yes, please. He reminded you to not apologize in your auditions, dance or otherwise. We love that idea. Um, 
But I do want to take a quick second to highlight something Stephen said about the myth of being all about singing, or maybe specifically the idea that like it's just to scream as loud as you can. Um, we touched on this a bit in the Mark Madama episode too for Michigan, um, where he reminded us that he does not accept the 12 loudest singers into his program. And as Stephen mentioned, there's nothing wrong with belting loud. It's a great thing. And if your voice can healthfully do that, you should totally find a moment in your audition where you can open up and let that voice out. Uh, that said, it just can't be the only thing that you're showing off. Um, it's something I see a lot with our students, whether it's master classes or early mock auditions before we've really gotten to talk about it, that they're coming in thinking the contest is like, who can belt the loudest? As if it's like an NBA combine, like who can jump the highest? Like you get like a score or something. And belting loudly, of course, is a skill and it's a really valuable skill to have in this industry, but it is just one skill. Um, to force this sports metaphor a bit more, because you know we need a sports metaphor, uh, a big, beautiful belt, I think of like a commanding slam dunk in basketball. It is really exciting to see, and it can make the crowd like leap to its feet. Woohoo! But if your NBA audition tape is all slam dunks, we've got a problem, right? A scout would see that first dunk and go, great, excellent, what else, right? But if we just keep saying dunk after dunk after dunk, we're going to be like, oh, that's, I guess, all they can do is just dunk. They can't shoot or dribble or pass or do anything else. So we would think to ourselves as auditioners, as artists, what else can I bring to the table that will make that athleticism, in this case, vocal athleticism, really special? At the professional NBA level, most players can dunk. And that's true uh, in the theater world as well. And most can even dunk pretty authoritatively. So what do you bring to the game or the audition that might set you apart? It's also worth noting that like some players, including my favorite player, Steph Curry, can barely dunk at all. And he's one of the best players in the world. And that's true for a lot of players who that's not a huge part of their skill set. Just like some singers, um, even some you might have just seen at the Tony Awards, are not known for their belting. You can have big, beautiful voice that isn't necessarily all about belting. Um, I also think it's worth noting, if we're going to torture this metaphor even a little bit more, that when you're thinking about auditions... The anticipation of what leads up to the dunk is often much more exciting than the dunk itself, right? Like if you ever see a dunk contest, they put on a costume and they do a thing and they dribble and they get the crowd excited and they bounce the ball and, the, and then the dunk itself is exciting, but only because of what's uh, built up into it. Um, so belting for just belting's sake is not nearly as exciting or as interesting as being able to build a piece that authentically leads you to produce that sound. So if that sound is emotionally and physically connected because of the work you've done acting wise and it's supported by the text of the piece, it's immensely more satisfying than just hearing an isolated loud shout, even if that isolated loud shout is a beautiful you know, sound that you're creating. Well, if you enjoyed the sound that we just created today on this episode, Megan just rolled her eyes at me, um, <laughs> please hit that follow button. Uh, we'd also appreciate it if you were to rate and review us wherever you found us. We suggest five stars if you're an actor singer who loves to dance and an ironic five stars if you're a dancer actor who loves to sing. Both totally valid. Uh, you can also reach out to us with questions for the pod at mailbag at mappingthecollegeedition.com. Uh, if you're interested in working with MTCA for help with your individual prep for your college audition journey, please check us out at mtcollegeauditions.com. To my young artists out there mapping their journeys, don't forget to be kind in this world. We'll see you next week.